What's up, Moto Buddies? This is Mike from Taco Moto Co. Taco Tours. All this stuff out here. This is the fuel system, fuel system components, and all kinds of goodies relating to the fuel injection system for any of the injected KTM, Husky, or Husaberg bikes. Uh, we're going to do a Mythbuster show today on these parts and components because there's tons, tons and tons of misunderstandings, myths, misrepresentations, confusion about what these things are, how they work, what they do, how they integrate together, what the, what the failures points are, what the upgrade and mod points are. So we're going to cover in, in, in entirety every single aspect of this so we get a very clear understanding of what's going on and how certain changes may or may not do anything at all, how certain changes may um, help your bike to run better, be more reliable, have better performance in some instances, but not many, um, and what you should know, maybe even what you should carry with you as far as spares and backups. So let's clear out this area a little bit and just talk. I think we should probably talk about, let's do this. Let's do a 10,000 foot overview, and then we'll dive into individual components and figure those out. So what we have here is the, I guess I'm going to throw this little cap on here. When we get to that, we'll cover it. Okay, so this is everything you have on your bike from end to end for an injected bike fuel system. Let's start up here at the end. This is what you have on the back of your gas tank. This is kind of like underneath your seat. When you pull that seat off, you'll see that your electrical connection, connection from the bike goes into this. Uh, you don't see this. This is all inside of the tank here. We don't get to the outside of the tank until the bottom down here. So from here at the bottom, up here at the top, all of this is inside of your tank. And what you have here is a fuel pressure regulator. It's a wire harness, pump. Well, pump's down here. This is the filter. Uh, then these are hoses. One of these is pressure line to the bike. One of these is pressure from the pump. And one of them is the return. Break that down later. This is the fuel low light. This is the low indicator light on your dash right here. Here's the pump motor itself, outlet port. This right here is where the pump motor lives. Outlet ports on the bottom of the pump that go to the injector, throttle body. This here is the pressurized, regulated pressure, quick disconnect coupling. This is just an anchor, uh, bolt, screw, whatever, adapter for the tank holding all of this inside of the tank. Over here on the throttle body itself, uh, you have the injector, which is lives right here. Here it is, so you can see it outside of that. And the injector port inside of the throttle body is right here. This is the outlet spray port and the air stream coming through here. This is the engine side. So that spray, that fuel spray is going, it's, it's being caught inside of the air flow as it goes into the engine. This would be the air filter side and that's not where the fuel goes. Fuel goes on the intake side on the other side of the butterfly. Uh, we have a video on the, on the knobs here. This is the red idle knob and then this is the fast idle knob right there. So there's a whole video that discusses that. TPS over here, and then this is the this little guy is the manifold pressure sensor, uh, the vacuum that's created on this side of the engine. So on the downstream side, again, this is the engine, the intake valves are over here. That vacuum pressure, notice that this is as close as it can be to the to the valves. That's where the more accurate reading is. Uh, any vacuum that's created is sensed through this little tube. You can see there's some machining that took place to get that vacuum pressure up. There's these little brass caps here where there was some machining and ultimately that pressure <clears throat> makes its way into the bottom of the sensor here and that's that's sampling and measuring engine vacuum on the intake valve side. So that's what's going, TPS over here. So that's going on with the throttle body um, and that's your complete end-to-end -end system. So let's dissect this and figure out what all these parts are. So over here I have a fuel assembly that's been dissected a little bit. So let's go back up here to the top where we started. Your connector from the bike plugs into here and I'm going to show you an adapter tool that we have available if you ever needed to test your fuel pump to determine if you had a fuel pump problem and try to isolate out say like the relay or some of the other components in the system. You can make these or you can get them from us but essentially what's going on here is this will clip in and it will give us our pinouts. And let me let me tell you what they are. So on the fuel pump itself, you have the red wire, which is pump motor, pump run, 
ground, and then the blue is the sender return. So the voltage reference back from the resistor, the therm resistor, well, we'll cover that in a second. How's that? So the only two we care about if we're trying to determine if the pump is going to run or not is the red and the black. And up here on the top, the red and the black come out to here. So let's orient it like this. So you're standing at your bike. The front of the bike is here. Back of the bike is over here. And then you've got your three pins. The far right one is your pump motor, pump positive, 12 volts to the pump. The middle one is ground. The blue, which is the, the uh, light reference, which we don't care about, is the far left. And so our little connector here, again, you can get these from us or make it yourself. You've got the red at the right and black in the middle. So you plug that in. And once you do, you can send 12 volts through this and you'll, you'll hear the pump run. It'll either run or it won't. And so that is a pass or fail test that you can do <clears throat> about the, the run. Uh, uh, whether or not the pump will run. So there's that. Okay, so up here at the top, we have this cavity, which I've taken out the pressure regulator, that right there. Very simple operation pressure regulator. Basically what's happening here, it's just like a thermostat. Um, so pressure, unregulated pressure from the pump. Um, so here's, let's see, here's a stock fuel pump right here. So this pump is putting out about 100 PSI bike needs about 50. So we drop it in half and we do it here at this pressure regulator. There is a spring inside of here holding a check valve. That's an off valve being pressed against the inlet side. And 100 PSI is being presented at that. The spring is regulated so that it lets 50 PSI through. And the 50 PSI that we don't want gets rejected out and comes out the side port here. And what that looks like when it's installed <clears throat> is this thing lives inside of that little chamber right there. And so the, the 100 PSI fuel coming out of the pump, the pump motor right here lives down inside of this little um, holder. And then that, that 100 PSI is coming out. 100 PSI goes through the filter. 100 comes up through here. And then when it gets inside of this little mixing chamber right here, there's three places that fuel is going, one, two, three. And so the inlet side comes into that chamber. And then this is like a bleed off. Think of this as just a, a, a bleed off valve, a check valve. Not quite a check valve. Let's call it a bleed off valve. So that 50 waste PSI comes out this port here. And then that left 50 still available within the chamber. And that's what we want. We want to use that 50 that's left over. And that comes out this hose here, runs down the side of the body. Notice you've got a metal port and it's the same. This is this this hose, this metal hose through the body is the same as the bottom outlet port here. And that is what we use. So we take that 50, here it is on this complete unit. We take the 50 out, we run it out through the bottom of the tank. Your there are three types of connectors that have been available on KTMs. One of them is the straight out, and that's typically you'll find that on the 12 through 16s. And that straight outlet port uh, it has a loop, the fuel line, if you look at your bike, the fuel line kind of loops out and then goes in the throttle body. Nothing wrong with that other than the possible, here's sort of an idea of what that would, you know, the hose would connect here and would give yourself that little loop on the bottom. The only problem with that could be potentially a vulnerability where a stick or something could come in and catch that and then uh, pull the hose off, tear the hose, pop a hole into it. And so that's happened. And, um, just that's something to be aware of if you have this little straight down, down outlet. If you have one of the ones that have a 90 on the newer bikes on the 20s, this is plastic and that's fine except for durability. So if you take a hit, you, you, you dump your bike, take a rock hit right here on this, it could snap the plastic components there. And so one of the upgrades would be to jump out and do a metal uh, of that. And we have those. And then you also may have a thin wall and a thick wall tank. So the thin wall tank, if you notice this little shoulder here is for a thin wall tank. And that would be like the stock tank. I'm sorry, this would be an aftermarket tank. So an, this is for an aftermarket tank. Aftermarket tanks are, are typically and always going to have a thinner shoulder. Stock, the stock enduro bikes, the plated bikes will have a thicker tank. They're more durable. The idea is it's more durability with a thicker tank more crash protection. 
and that shoulder will be thicker. It'll be a couple, maybe a millimeter or two thicker. And then the aftermarket tanks, which are all about weight, uh, typically, and the motocross bikes will have a thin wall shoulder. So there's two different shoulders for all those different mix-ups of tanks, and they're not interchangeable. And um, I have seen and heard of guys who will, here's a, here's a real problem that you can encounter looking at this one. That shoulder right there needs to mate up with the bottom of the tank. And I've seen guys have the wrong shoulder on the wrong, on the fitting. And what they would probably have would be a um, long wall. They have a short, they have a thin tank and they have a long adapter. And so there's a gap in there because the adapter is bottoming out. I'll just kind of demonstrate here on this. The adapter is going to bottom out against the bottom of the fuel pump body. And there's still a gap within the tank, within the bottom of the, sh the shoulder of this in the tank. And they think, oh, I just need to tighten this more to uh, get rid of that gap. And there is no more because it's bottomed out. And so this will snap off. And if that happens, your SOL because you cannot get any this is not rebuildable and you have to buy the whole thing and I think it's like 300 bucks it's, it's super expensive so when you reassemble your tank if you're changing tanks swapping tanks be very aware of whether or not you have this short shoulder stock tank type well this is the aftermarket again this is this is the motocross version uh, it looks like I don't have a long one here uh, but you get the idea you have short or long these are both shorts the long is noticeably has more depth here to that okay so something to be aware of a problem that I've seen all right so plastic or metal straight or bent then once the fuel comes out you're gonna go through lots of bikes have different formed hoses you're gonna come up here to this connection this is the quick disconnect there is a check valve inside of here and then you have, the, so that's the female side, and then the male side is right here. There's an O-ring. Be aware that this O-ring does not last forever, and it can split and tear, and you can have leaks there. Be aware that there is a cone filter inside of here. We'll talk about that later when we cover filters. Be aware that there is a little detent pin on this collar here, and what that does is that pin contacts the edge of your male fitting here, and once those come into contact with each other, kind of simulate that here, that depresses this, this collar here, which is spring-loaded, and then that shunts against this, this little grooved ring here, and then that's going to lock this so that they do not separate apart. So sometimes you might be trying to insert this, and the pin has inadvertently gotten pressed. This collar slides out and you'll just fight that. So just be aware that uh, to install this, you need to have that be in the open position. Another totally classic problem, I get this all the time, is guys will insert this and they will not, they will just insert, well here's, it's a combination of two things. They don't insert this far enough until it clicks and then this is a dry, they, this o-ring is dry. This o-ring is trying to slide through here and if there's gasoline, gasoline is a solvent and it makes rubber sticky. So you're trying to slide this rubber O-ring in, in tight contact here with this opening because this shoulder here on the male needs to depress this little uh, check valve in there. And if that isn't depressed, then gas, pressurized gas is not gonna flow through the fitting. This is not an open fitting, this is a shunt fitting. That, and because of that, when you disconnect this from your bike, you notice that you don't get residual pressure from the fuel system all the 50 psi fuel that would be in this line <clears throat> if you didn't have that little check valve there that fuel psh, would just spray out that'd be very dangerous all that pressurized gas you know a, a couple of cc's of it spraying out on you on your hot bike that would be a problem so by design this has that check valve in there well to get gas to flow the end of this has to depress that. And so guys, because this is a dry O-ring, there'll be a lot of friction, stiction as you slide that in and they'll get it, you know, they'll put some, they'll exert some force onto that and they'll feel like it just sort of stops. It's, it, it, it goes to some sort of end point they perceive and then they feel it's plugged in. Well, it, it isn't and they're never accessing that feel right there. And so you, I've got two tips for you. The first thing is, whenever you remove this, what I like to do 
uh, is put some grease. Now there's going to be gas on here, so wipe this off with a paper towel <clears throat> and then put some grease, any kind of grease. You can even use engine oil. If you're out in the field on the bike, you can um, pull your engine filler cap off and then just wick your finger. It's going to be hot, but you can wick your finger against the clutch plates, get a little oil on here, and then run that over. Vaseline, chapstick, whatever, whatever you have on hand, but you need to put some lube on there. And then when you slide this in, it will slide. This, is, this particular one happens to have some red wheel bearing grease on it. And so, so does this. So it slides in really well. But once you get that in there, then you'll notice, listen here, click. If you don't hear that click, then that ring collar has not, act, has not slid out and has locked that. And then you have not accessed and depressed the inner valve in there. So all of that needs to happen. And so many guys will do something to their bike, they'll screw around with something, and then it won't run, and that's the problem. Huge issue. Make sure you are aware of that. And then going down here, we, you know, we talked about the, the fuel injector lives right here, and so that's probably what you should know about that much of the system. So jumping back over here to this one, let's continue on. We left off at the fuel pressure regulator. So that once that's installed with the O-ring down, once that's installed, the, the 50 that we want, the regulated pressure, again, it goes out and we saw what that does. Now what happens to the 50 that we're bleeding off? That connects here to this hose and that 50 then is running down through this other hose and it's going into the top of the assembly. Let me pull this apart for you here. So when we remove this little top hat, we'll see that the 50 through this hose, that's the bleed off, just is exhausted out this little hole right there. So there is a little hole here, and that is where the, the 50 that we're, we're sending back into the system to be recycled again comes into this pump body right here. So here's something that comes up all the time. Guys will ask, well, what about the air bubbles that are in my fuel tank or in the fuel system? And here's this, this is where the air bubbles come from. And the main culprit here is when the gas drops below the, okay. So there's an air gap that'll form as the gas is dropping underneath the level of that outlet port. And if the gas drops beneath that, anywhere in the rest of this section of the tank, and you still got, you know, quite a few miles left in the tank when fuel has dropped beneath there. And so when it does, when fuel is beneath there, that air is, or that, that fuel rather, in a little stream, like, like out of the end of a hose, is spraying just through air and then it's hitting the gas level, wherever that level may be. So just like when you take your garden hose and you spray it into a bucket of water or to the pool, it's gonna, it's gonna grab air and then take that air with it into the liquid. That's what's happening here. That's what those air bubbles are from. So as the tank level drops beneath there, you're gonna get air bubbles. If the air, uh, if the gas is above that level right there, there still may be some occasional bubbles. You will infrequently see bubbles when the gas is up here at the higher level. It can, uh, you can, you can see some bubbles, but not that many. It's primarily going to be down here. So that's the bubble situation. And um, let's talk about this therm resistor, thermistor. So how does this work inside of this little metal? cavity right here is the blue reference line. So we're sending the, the, the ground side of the um, light bulb on your dash for the low fuel through the blue wire here. And as long as this, so it's a, it's a temperature, a therm resistor is a temperature, uh, how do I say it? The value of the resistor changes based on temperature. And so when gas is covering this, the resistor is cold the gas cools the resistor, and so the value is at its, its highest. Um, I'm sorry, it's backwards, the lowest. So the lowest resistance is when the gas is up here and it's cool. And so the light will be off because there is no pathway to ground. So essentially, this is the, 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 this is the ground side of the light bulb, and it's looking for this ground right here. And this is effectively an open circuit when this resistor is cool. But as gas level drops, power wants to work its way through the resistor, through the circuit to ground. And so as that begins to happen, the temperature of the resistor rises and the, the warmer that gets 
due to the gas level dropping, continually dropping, and there's little holes in the bottom of this to let the gas in there, so gas is inside of that. And so as the temperature of that resistor increases, the resistance goes down, which presents the pathway to ground, and the light will come on. And on the older bikes that have the incandescent light bulb, you've noticed that the, the low, level, low fuel level light starts to glow dimly and then increases until it's at full intensity as the gas drops. And that's because that resistor is warming up and then resistance is dropping, decreasing until now it's got full pathway to ground and the light is at full intensity. So that's what's happening inside of here. If this circuit fails, your, if your light doesn't come on, you may have a bad light bulb, but you also may have a bad resistor. And this is, unfortunately, none of these in-tank components except for the filter and the pump motor are replaceable. Everything is, uh, and some of these hoses, everything is only serviceable or replaceable if you buy the whole entire OE stock unit assembly for a lot of money. So some guys, what they'll do is when this thermosistor goes bad is they will dig into this and do surgery and, and replace that and re-solder a new one in there. And I've done that and it's a drag, it's a pain. Um, I wish someone, and in the comments, if you would let me know, do you know of anyone who makes this entire unit so you could just solder, solder, and replace that on its own? I'd love to know that. Otherwise, you have to do some surgery, and it, it's not fun. All right, so that's what's happening at the top there. Um, again, this is the return side, the pressure return side. Now, the outlet side, let's cover that, the fuel pump. Uh, here, here's the better representation. This is what what you get, what you see when you pull your pump out. Notice that it is sort of slotted. See how there's the opening here, the side the, that has the little groove that uh, goes and, and accepts this port here. And so that slides down in there. It just kind of sits there. Top cap comes over like that, snap, snap, the thing clicks in there, and then your unregulated full outlet pressure of the pump, about 100, goes into the filter and then up through the system like we talked about. So what are some of the failure points that can happen here? Pump motors, pump motors fail, can fail, do fail. Um, not all the time, it's not a widely worried about thing. Um, let's, let's, let's cover what's going on inside. So. All of us should be, and if not, we can. you can do some research on this. This is an electric motor. Very, very simple. There's an impeller, a water pump impeller, like on your swimming pool, or like the water pump on the 17 plus bikes that, um, or if you've seen uh, the Hoover Dam, if you've been in Vegas, Hoover Dam, Boulder Dam, you've seen that little water impeller that drives the generators in the dam. And that's exactly what this looks like. It's a little water impeller, uh, but that's sucking gas. So gasoline, as the motor spins, is drawn up through the impeller blades here on the bottom, like a turbo uh, uh, engine input, input uh, uh, the air intake turbo blades, very similar to that. Those blades spin, they pull fuel, and the body of the pump itself is transmitting the fuel. This is all sealed up, so this is pressure tight. It's pressure tight from the bottom to the top all the way out, and so the gas under pressure is being fed and pushed up through the central body of the motor. So the armature, the, the, the uh, brushes, the bearings, everything inside of this is, is lubricated and cooled through the pressurized gas that's being pushed from here up through the pump motor and then out up the top. So some of the ways this can fail is the impeller can spin off of the shaft. On the stock uh, motor, it's a smooth shaft, and then it's just a press fit down on the impeller and those can and do bleed off, not bleed off, but spin off. And that could create a problem. On the stock motor, it is a, um, the magnet is not a rare earth magnet and it's not a uh, forged magnet, it's a cast magnet. And so because of that, the metal can fatigue the glue. I've seen the glue come apart and I've seen the two poles of the two half, half C magnets uh, click come into contact with each other and that could cause a motor to fail the the magnets i've seen them break apart <clears throat> i've seen the bearings fail these things will make noise there's just all kinds of little failure points on one of these pump motors because there's quite a quite a few things going on in here i've also seen bikes that won't run because the tabs here i've seen a tab break off i've seen the connections the little tabs on the wiring not make good contact 
um, I have seen where the upper assembly, the plastic here, will snap off. And so all of these can happen. Again, it's not a given that these failures may happen to you, but they do. And so the uh, remedy here is to replace just the pump motor, not this entire assembly. You could if you want to, or you could just do a little surgery and replace the motor itself. So let's take a look at what's going on here. Here's one of the filters in the system, and this little cap, is. this is basically a sock. This is the first filter in the system. You have this little snorkel which comes down on the bottom of the pump. There's the impeller inlet port right there. You can see that. So this little snorkel is coming down. <clears throat> and let's do a quick little orientation here about the fuel inlet. So this snorkel, it fits down inside minimum amount of fuel that can be sitting in this tank and still be drawn up into that snorkel is only about a quarter of an inch or so off the bottom the very bottom of the possibility of any fuel coming in contact with that snorkel. So very low, that's when you're out of gas. So that snorkel <clears throat> might look something, I'm just trying to roughly guesstimate, remember that top gap that we had above the top here and the top of the motor, just guesstimating about like that. So that is your final allowance of between the bottom of the, the bracket here and then the bottom of the snorkel that's you're out of gas. Any gas that remains at that lowest level, you're not going to be able to access. I have heard of guys take a little extra piece of something and then they'll throw it on here to drop it just a little bit further. Boy, that's getting really picky, isn't it? To try to get that last little slurp of gas that might still be in the tank. You could do that if you want. That's kind of OCD as far as I'm concerned. <clears throat> but you see that bottom gap. Now, how does gas get into this body? Because the, the, the pump motor itself, the snorkel, is pulling gas out of the inner chamber of this. And why does it do that? It's mainly for slosh protection. So because gas in your tank is sloshing around, when it got to be low, if when it's low, this might cavitate and draw air as that last little bit of gas in your tank is sloshing around. So the whole idea behind this, this body in the first place is not only to add some structural rigidity to all these components, but to prevent sloshing <clears throat> so that you don't cavitate that last little bit of gas in your tank. So how is fuel then drawn into this body? Well, if gas is at the higher level, any anytime the gas is over this whole thing, then this is completely immersed in gas. It's, it's leaking through here, it's coming through the top of this, all the gaps of all of this, this is not, you know, pressure sealed against any of this so gas is easily and readily just sort of flowing through all these cap these gaps and cracks okay but when gas drops beneath this this little opening here for the clip all the gas between here and empty is drawn through these two holes right there there and there okay it might be hard to see them right there and then one on the other side so all the gas that your bike uses and, and, and here's, here's kind of a myth. <clears throat> the myth is that this is a high flow, high consumption motorcycle and that you need to increase and improve gas flow through different parts of the system to aid in performance of the engine, drivability of the engine, and to cure things like the cough and stall. If that was the case, then <clears throat> we would need, so if we were flowing so much fuel through this injector, and here, here it is. You can see, you probably can barely see how small, hopefully we focus here, how small and minute those little outlet ports are on the injector. So if it was the case that we needed more gas at any point in the system to run that injector and to, to heal and to cure any of these drivability problems on our bikes by opening up or improving any of this flow, we have a dramatic engineering fail by only having these two micro holes supplying all the gas that our bike needs to run on when it drops below here. So the um, analysis would say if that was the case that we needed to improve anything in the system downstream then the engineering uh, department would not have given us such two tiny holes to supply all the gas that the bike is running on, common sense would say these should be massive. We should have a whole something to this size if it was the case that we needed to improve gas flow anywhere in the system. And yet, 
uh, the engineering department and all of the people who check these things and design these things and sign off on these things felt it sufficient to provide just these two little holes to supply all the gas that the bike needs to run on from this point to this point. So this is where um, we apply engineering logic and say we must have a very low fuel demand, a very low fuel demand on our downstream system sufficient to only be supplied by these two holes. So they're um, kind of debunking any of these uh, concepts or ideas or thoughts that we need, to, we need to do something. We need to modify any part of our fuel system. So with that said, um, these two fuel holes are what supply all your running gas when the, when the tank drops below that level. I have heard of guys who hear this. I, I've told this to guys. And then they kind of panic thinking, holy crap, I need to mod my fuel system to get better performance or to solve a cough install. And they'll pull all this apart and they'll drill out these holes to make them bigger with the, with the idea of pulling in more gas to feed the system sufficient to you know solve some problem. And yet there is no problem to be solved. There is no problem. And this is more than sufficient. And I have built Baja 1000 bikes with these two little holes. And so uh, I don't do that. I don't recommend it. I don't, it's, it's not a bad idea, but it's a waste of time. Um, making any real changes or mods to your fuel system um, to you know, supposedly increase performance or fuel flow is a waste of time. So I don't do any of that. I run a completely stock end-to-end -end fuel system on every bike, every time, and I don't worry about a thing. So moving on, let's talk about we know what this outlet port is. This is the pressure. This is 50 psi to the injector. What is this guy? This is really just basically an anchor point. All of this needs to be anchored into the tank. And that collar, that threaded collar, let's use this one. That's your straight one. The, no, that's not the right one. Where the hell did I put it here in all this stuff? Oh, it's on this other one. All right. So this threaded collar here. is what comes here and anchors the bottom of your tank the bottom the bottom of this assembly to the tank that's just basically like a, a bolt a nut rather to lock this thing in so why is there a hole in there i don't know i don't really understand why there's a hole in there because this goes nowhere it's a dead end and this just threads on and there's an o-ring that that protects um, this and, and uh, seals it against the bottom of the tank so you don't have any fuel leaks so this large diameter o-ring seals the bottom of the tank against fuel leaks. Also, I should point out, there is an O-ring that goes in between here and here. So notice how this is dished out a little bit. That is what seals the, the bottom of this against the tank, and that preserves the pressure. So there's two O-rings here. There's one that fits in this groove. That just seals the tanks against drip leaks, just same as this one does. These are basically drip, drip leak O-ring grooves there. But then this one is very important because that O-ring, and I've had guys put this together and omit that O-ring, and you will bleed pressure out of the system and your bike won't run good. So you need to have this small diameter O-ring that fits in there. And then that, this one, will tighten up against the bottom of that properly. And then that O-ring that we just talked about is going to sit between here and here. And that preserves full pressure from the pump body through the connector and out and you don't get leakage there, and that's pressure loss. So that's what's going on with that thing. So back to this other big one, what the crap does this thing do? Well, it is just an anchor nut, and in the bottom, looking down in here, you'll see there's a little bit of an indentation where that snorkel, right, kind of down in there, where that snorkel will fit um, down in there. And so that's where your fuel is drawn into the, the bottom of the snorkel on the, on the pump there. So I don't know. I don't know what this hole is for. It doesn't do anything. Um, they probably could have made that without the hole, but they did. Maybe on some applications, they do something with that. Um, so that's what's going on there. Okay, so let's jump back over to this. So the bottom of the snorkel is where the fuel is pulled in. So this is a 60 micron filter. This screen right here is what's going to trap any of the sand or boogers or leaves or just anything that falls into your gas tank. When you pull your gas cap off, and any little chunks or anything at all that falls into the tank, that stuff is going to be trapped and prevented from being drawn into the pump with, with this guy right there. And then the next 
the next filter in the system post that is this guy right here. This is the in-tank filter. This one happens to be 40 microns. So we go 60 at first phase. Phase two right here is 40 micron. This one, let's just cover all these, I guess, since we're here at this point. This cone one, cone filter that lives here in the quick disconnect, this one that goes there is a 10. And then there's an injector, a final screen in the injector itself, and that one is also a 10. So moving backwards, we have two 10s, then a uh, 40, and then a 60. So that's our filtration system. And all of those filters have one goal, keep debris out of the end of this injector intake port. If this gets clogged, then you will reduce or eliminate fuel coming out of the bottom of the injector. And there's some ways that you can diagnose that, and there's some ways that you can clean that, and we'll cover that as well. So. That fuel filter that's happening here in the tank, this guy, um, let's talk about a few options because there are some concerns out there that guys have about the plastic one, this Mahl, Mel, M-A-H-L-E, this German company filter right here. This is the one that comes stock on your bike. And here are some examples of some different types of filters that guys use instead of and in place of this filter here, the stock one. And so some of the advantages are the fact that if you switch to a metal body one, you eliminate the potential of a crack developing in the top cap of the filter or a complete failure rupture. I've never seen any of these rupture outright, but I have seen some pinhole leaks along the edge here where the seal um, has some issue and then you lose pressure out of that. Um, and I've seen the top of these here snap off and, and that one probably was due to some rough handling and poor installation of a replacement. The ethanol and the gas is said to attack and eat this little uh, seal point up here. So there can be some potential failure problems with the stock one. I run these and I actually prefer these, the stock ones, the clear ones, over any of the ones that are not viewable. And the reason is, is because I like to be able to do periodic maintenance by visually checking my fuel filter often. And so what, what I'll do is when the gas level drops beneath the fuel uh, filter itself, I like to look at the color of that and just kind of gauge how black it's getting. Now here's a myth that the, that the dirt, the black, this thing will discolor black over time. And the myth is that this is just tank debris, uh, sand, uh, dust, whatever, or contaminants in the gas that is, that is being trapped inside. And that's changing the color and that's a complete myth. What the black is, is the brushes from the motor inside the pump. So this is a standard typical electric motor with brushes and the carbon of the brushes as the as it erodes against the armature those have to go somewhere it's being pulled up through the gas and then it's being trapped by this filter that's what the job of this filter is is to trap and catch all the brush carbon coming off that motor so here's a here's a little hack that guys will do they'll say oh well i don't want to maintain this or i don't care about this or i don't need that and they'll take a straight a straight connector a piece of copper tubing or something and they'll just bypass this filter uh, entirely and not have it. Well, the downside to that is you, and the upside is, is you don't have filter maintenance here, but the downside is, is that carbon, remember we're sending 50% of the fuel that's coming out of this pump just back into the tank to be recycled. So we're recycling hundreds of gallons through a whole tank of gas, hundreds of gallons worth of fuel is being recycled and pulled back into the system. So if we don't, if we don't trap and capture and get rid of that carbon, that carbon load is going to continue to just saturate through the gas and going through the pump. And that's going to continue to deteriorate the life expectancy of this pump because we've got dirty, gritty gas being drawn through uh, and attacking the bushings and the armature and the brushes up here, which are being continually saturating gas. It's just going to deteriorate the life of the pump. So do not believe anyone who says that it's a clever hack to get rid of this pump. You need that, in, or the filter, you need that in-tank fuel filter. The only thing you can do is what kind of filter are you going to use? So I told you why I like the stock one. I also look at it by color for color. I replace these. So uh, about, well, not once a year, but for sure every two years, uh, I will pull this whole assembly out, just put a visual on it, and then I will replace this filter right here. I don't ever let this go more than two years. 
and um, these are cheap and they're easy, super easy to get. And so that's what I do on my bikes. Now I know guys who use the metal filter and they work just great. They work absolutely fine. There's a myth out there that because these, and this is true, these are specced out for Yugos and like Chevy S10 trucks in the 80s and early 90s and Dodge minivans and K cars from the 80s and 90s. That is absolutely true. This is a filter that was designed and is used for those carbureted cars. There's a myth out there that because this is an injected system running at about 50 PSI, well, the outlet, here I'll say this, the outlet pressure, the unregulated pressure going in the bottom is 100. So you have 100 PSI, but no flow. And that's not entirely true. You do have flow, but you have a very low amount of flow. In fact, the fuel flow is low enough that it never completely fills the body of the filter here. And if you ever wanted to do a test, and I'll probably have to make a video about this, if um, one of the things I do to leak test these is put this body into a cup of gas and then I leave everything above exposed because I want to look for leaks anywhere in the system. It'll just spray out. Do this outside. Keep a fire extinguisher handy. And so I'll connect 12 volts to this lead right here. And now the pump is in gas and it's flowing through the system. And I'm looking for leaks. One of the things that, that I have noticed over doing this many, many times is the fact that the gas never completely fills up the body of the filter. And you can move this and you'll see there's an air gap inside of here because there's not enough flow, there's not enough volume consumed to um, even push out the air that sort of gets trapped inside of the filter. If I turn it upside down uh, a couple of times, I can typically get that to go out. But there's just not enough flow to deteriorate or to do any damage to the paper media. And this one's paper too. These are paper. So inside of here is, is paper for these... Um, for, is the filter media. And so there's just not enough, enough, enough flow through. There would be at full volume, that 100 PSI at full outlet port rate, that would be sufficient, but we're not. We're dropping it by half. So we're only sending 50 PSI at a very low flow rate through that filter. So any reports of damage to these because this is a carbureted spec filter on a fuel injected bike uh, is a misrepresentation of the reality of this. And so we use these very reliably, reliably all the time. Again, my personal preference is the stock filter, but I have no problem recommending these metal ones to you. There's two commonly used ones. This is a Wix 33095. This one is made by Purelator and it's an F29160. F29160 33095. You can get um, I don't think I stock the Purelator for, for whatever reason. I just use the Wix. And the reason these particular ones are used is because they have the same diameter as this one here. They're roughly the same length. The, um, the inlet here is a little different. And so here's a pro tip. Whenever you install these, you'll need to heat up your hose. This is a very rigid type of plastic hose for the fuel line. Heat that up with a hairdryer. Do not use a um, heat gun, but just a hairdryer, simple hairdryer. Heat this up, get it, get it a little soft. Here's another pro tip. If you're out in the field and you're doing this like I've done, I've replaced all of these components, fuel motor and then fuel filters on a beach in Mexico. And so you don't have a hairdryer. So what you can do is you can take the assembly here, this unit that's out of the bike to another bike, start it. So the hot exhaust acts as a hairdryer uh, across the hose, soften it up. Just And by soften, I don't mean turn it into jello. I just mean get it warm, nice and warm, toasty warm, and then you'll be able to put this over any one of these. So this side or this, whatever whatever filter you have, you're going to want to warm that up. And so whether it's a hairdryer or the hot exhaust of a bike in a beach in Mexico, that's what you do. Get that on there. Save you a lot of time I'm trying to force that on. And then a third option here <clears throat> for the filter that a lot of guys get excited over, and, and I kind of like this one for couple of reasons. One is it's a metal body. This is made by, well, here's the, <clears throat> here's the card. This is Earl's race performance. I don't know where I picked this up. Somebody might've sent it to me and you can see the part number there. Pause the video if you want to capture that. But this is a 10 micron metal filter that will take the place of this filter. And something that uh, you'll notice is it's, it's, it is longer. Okay. And so you're going to have an extra kink in your fuel line. But to that, I would maybe point out the fact that we sell a 
fuel hose replacement kit and then we've got a shorter hose that would work for that and so there's a workaround for that as opposed to having kind of some extra kinking in a hose in your tank but I think one of the advantages of this little filter is it's serviceable it has a centered bra bronze <clears throat> filter media and this is kind of an old school way of doing um, filters and uh, it's 10 micron so that's the capture rate and it's got a large surface area but you can clean this you can put air pressure on the back side get some carb spray some fuel whatever and then blow this out backwards and so if you have this type of filter then you can pull this apart and clean it out you don't have to buy anything you don't have to buy uh, any replacement inserts and I think that's kind of a clever way to go I again I don't run this and I don't want to run this because I'm very satisfied with what I get out of the stock filter but I don't have a strong opinion really about any one of these I think they're all fine I would almost say they're all equal um, you can get much more tricky than this and there are some even trickier versions of any of these um, but but for my money I just run the stock one and I've yet to have a problem I've yet to have a failure um, on any of my bikes because of that and that one time when we were in Mexico and we replaced the filter we did it just because we had everything apart and it looked dirty the guy had about 70 hours when his pump failed and we just swapped it out because we were already in there and I carry these filters let's talk really quick that's a good segue into what do I carry with me when I am out on a ride I carry a spare pump motor that right there I carry a spare injector um, a couple of hose clamps of different sizes I, I carry some of the ones for the outside fuel line here like this size I carry some of the in tank ones like this size that's one for the the little in tank hoses right there I carry those um, let's see I feel like I'm missing something oh I carry a filter and uh, some hose itself some gas line pressurized this is fuel injection line and then I don't have it here but I also carry um, a spare ECU for the bike I'm riding and am I thinking of anything else? I think that's it. Oh, and I also carry one of the little cone filters, wherever that went, but the little gray inline cone filter, I carry one of those. And I have never, here it is right there. I got this guy in my little spare kit and I've never carried a regulator. And doing this video right now makes me think, you know, I probably should. There's no downside to that. It doesn't weigh anything or take up any space really. So I think I'm going to carry a regulator from now on. And then I carry a couple of these O-rings here on this fuel connector. So that represents my um, spares pack regarding fuel systems when I go on a ride. And um, you can plan on your, you know, how you, how you want to handle that, carry none of these, carry all of these. Typically when I'm on a ride, I'm there to maybe service my, my own bike, but maybe the guys that are with me. And so I sort of act as the pack meal for all those spares so that's that okay so let's move past there i think we've covered all that i think we've done filters let's talk about one last filter that you may want to consider doing an upgrade on and that's this 10 micron small cone filter this little guy remember how small this is now it's a little bit deceiving this seems like it's small and it is it's a cute little diminutive thing but if you were to if you were to cut out the media here and then put that out flat, um, it would be it would impress you of how much surface area there is on that, you know, the length and then um, the the cross section of that. But it is still small, and so a nice upgrade that gives a lot of peace of mind is to go with something like a Golon. This is made by Golon. Zip Tie Racing also has one. I don't have it here because I'm bone out of those. Totally sold out on those. Very popular and. Uh, because of all this COVID stuff, uh, zip ties had a hard time keeping up with demand. So I just have this one. But you see this nice little disc, and it's serviceable. You can clean that out. This particular one happens to be perforated. The zip tie version is a flat plate that's a double screen, 10 micron. Both of these are 10, and they're serviceable and replaceable. If this fails, which it won't, but if it did, or you damaged it, which is how these go bad, when you're servicing it, you can replace these. And these are O-ring sealed, and you can replace the O-rings. And both the zip tie and the Golon here are structurally identical. They are, they are like first cousins. They're like tw identical twins of each other, really, just just <clears throat> uh, slightly different. But they're serviceable, and this is really key. There are other filters out there that I've seen that are like this, but they're not serviceable. You can't, 
visually clean them. I guess you could back pressure f clean them, but my personal preference on this filter is to have a visual inspection on that so that I know that the screen is intact. If I can't take it apart and see the screen, I don't know whether or not that, that it is intact. So I do like these. I, I, I'm partial to the zip tie one. Zip tie, uh, Ty Davis supports the sport. Uh, he's a good friend to the motorcycle industry and to all the riders. And so while the Golan is a fine filter and I, and I have no problem with it, I do personally run and like and recommend the zip tie just because he's, he's such a good advocate to the sport. But, but again, the Golan is just fine. And um, <clears throat> when you get these, this particular one is a true inline where you would cut the hose and you would insert it and then clamp it. The zip tie, and then there's another version of the Golan where the outlet side here, well, that used to be the inlet side, is the same, is the same architecture here as the quick disconnect. So what that allows you to do is to insert this, hose clamp it, and then just press that into the female side of your gas tank connector, wherever that is. I can't find it. Here's, 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 here's one right here. So it would just click in, click, and then you would have that. You'd have your quick disconnect and then your filter. It would take the place of that right there. So that's that for filters and upgrades. <clears throat> Guys ask me, let's drop back to this real quick. Guys, guys ask me if this is necessary. No, it's not. It's not, it's, it's not necessary. It is necessary that you have a filter in here. Absolutely. You need to have at least this. But if you upgrade to this, it will give you peace of mind and it will give you a lot better surface area. But uh, is it necessary? No. So this is a nice upgrade, but not essential. All right. Uh, doo -doo -doo. Here is a common myth that I hear all the time. These are the uh, single tab ear band clamps. Guys will debate, should, should I use these over these? I use both. There are guys who will get their panties in a bunch and say, never use a band clamp type because they will always fail. They can fail, and I have seen some failures, but it is super duper duper rare. And so I am a fan of both and use both and don't have a preference. So there's just my opinion on whether or not you should only and always use a clamp like this or a worm gear type clamp. I say poppycock nonsense to the guys who tell you in the, in the interwebs that you should never use these, only use these. In fact, on my bikes, uh, in a minute when we talk about fuel injector, I strip off these connectors in a few key places on my fuel system and install these for the purpose of being able to service uh, clean that. Let's just talk about it now. Okay, so you're out on the trail. Here's a good kind of pro tip. You're out on the trail and you have through your diagnostic uh, steps determined that your injector is clogged. Here is a field hack that you can do. You can remove on the bottom of your tank. So this is, let me just kind of represent it like this. Here is, this is this is your 50 PSI coming from the bottom of your tank, the bottom of the pump, and then this, the injector would be up here upstream. So your bike won't run because you have got a clogged fuel injector. Well, what I do is, oh, here, I just represent it right there. Okay, so this is connected into the tank. So what, what I've done and would recommend you do is you can remove the fuel injector out of the throttle body, and then you can take this connector off, which I, I cut off the single, single ear, and then I put on a hose clamp there. And so you can pull this off of your bike, remove this hose from the throttle body. Throttle body stays on the bike, fuel injector comes off the bike. Remove that hose, and then with the clamp, I'll put the injector into the hose here. The, this is your 50 PSI. Throw your clamp on here, snug that thing down, leave this plugged into the bike so that you get the electrical signal and then crank the bike, hit the start button. And so now the injector is opening and you've got 50 PSI right here and you're back flushing out the injector. And so if there's any boogers inside of the, the screen, that 10 micron screen, that final screen of the injector, any of those boogers are gonna get shot out. And let me, let me paint you a different word picture. You are not going to get like a stream. If you did the injector this way, and some of the guys have seen that, the injector will spray out in a fine mist, okay? You're not gonna see that when you do it backwards. It's sort of like looking up, up the backwards ends of, of a telescope or binoculars. You'll still see, um, but it will not be what you expect to see when you, when you float it this way. What you'll see 
when you go backwards is that <clears throat> you'll get sort of like a dribble of fuel out of here. And when it's plugged, and I've done this twice, if it's plugged and you're cranking the bike, you will get no gas until finally that thing, the clog in there sort of releases, and then you'll get like a little pressure shot, and then it'll just be a nice little drip stream, like the, like the landscaping emitter dripper. That's what's going to be happening. It'll be a pretty fast, steady drip, drip, drip coming out of that. And that represents the uh, release of that clog and then free flow of the gas. And then on that one particular bike I'm thinking of, we threw everything back together. Bike ran just fine and continues to run fine to this day. So there is a quick field hack uh, dealing with clogged injectors in the field. And again, on a new bike, I will... So how's the orientation of this? I guess it would be about like that. On the, so if I'm sitting... Oh, what the hell? I don't know. Uh, there it is, right there. Okay, so back of the bike here, front of the bike here. And you'll see that this is on the bottom. So uh, on all my bikes, I will cut off the single tab air connector type. I will put on a hose clamp for the sole purpose of being able to do that field hack uh, to try to solve a dirty injector out in the field. Okay, so that is everything there. I think we're probably done with that forever. And the injector, I think we're good there. Okay, so jumping back to some of this stuff kind of starting to wrap this up, I think. So we've talked about all these components. I think we have a pretty good understanding of what's going on there. The hose, the pump, uh, the pressure regulator. Let's talk about some of the drivability problems that you may encounter if you have weak fuel pressure. Weak fuel pressure could come from one of two places, either a faulty, well, there's a lot of places actually as I think about it. So you could have a faulty regulator. The uh, the potential uh, of this failing is pretty low. I've changed some of these out, but not many. Uh, that, that, that's a pretty reliable little system. You have a spring and a plunger. I have seen one of these fails where that little plunger, it's like a little piston inside the body of here, kind of got cockeyed sideways and it stuck open. So it was, it was bleeding off more. So his pressure was low because it was over bleeding. Uh, it was over regulating. I don't think I've ever seen any of these get plugged closed. If it did, you would have more than 50 PSI going to your bike. And so your bike, would, it's funny, if you had more pressure than you needed, your bike would run, would run rich and it would probably run better because you're just, um, it depends on how your air, air fuel ratio is on your bike. But if you had a lean bike, this is kind of a little diagnostic thing. If you had a lean bike and then you were, this was failed in the, closed position so you were sending more than 50 psi your bike would run better because now you're feeling it more fueling it more correctly than it was before than your lean bike if this failed in the open position and you were under fueling your bike you had low fuel pressure your bike would be sluggish and would not have the same power that you were used to and that could be caused by this you could also have weak outlet pressure from your pump and that would be uh, causing you to run lean and weak and sluggish you could have a split in your filter or your filter could be clogged. And uh, a quick word on maintenance schedules. I like to change these at 30 or 40 hours on a new bike because the, the brushes are bedding in on a new bike and a new pump motor uh, with the first 30, 40 hours, and it's going to shed the most. And so that, that needs to be changed out 30, 40 hours. And then after that, when I'm on my second one, I'll probably do it about 100 hours or two years, whichever comes first. I don't like these to sit in there for more than two years. And, I, and again, I like to put an eye on all this stuff because this is super important. So uh, there's a word on that. And you could have leaks anywhere along the system. And like I said, I will troubleshoot all this. Here's, here's my tools for troubleshooting. So I have a gauge here that we sell and you can make one of these yourself if you like. You can see that there's a through connector. Uh, the advantage of having this type of setup is we are doing a dynamic pressure instead of static. So that is to say, we can check fuel pressure when the bike is running. We can put this on the bike and then go for a test ride and then watch that pressure through the throttle range and see if it drops anywhere. And then that can help us diagnose and pinpoint problems. So we've got fuel in and fuel out. We are, we are riding the bike while we're monitoring fuel pressure. Some of the other ones out there only do it in a static setup where you plug this into the bottom of the tank and then you crank and you're going to be able to check pressure outlet pressure of the pump 
but you won't see it dynamically to see if it changes while you're riding the bike. And ours does that. You can get it from us or you can make one yourself with these available components. But um, one of the data points that I ask when guys call and they have drivability problems is what's your fuel pressure? Because if your pressure is low, your bike will exhibit drivability problems um, that we need to determine, do you have a fuel problem or an ignition problem or some other issue going on? And the one of the more common failure points is fuel pressure. And so we need, we need to know. Uh, I kind of recommend everybody should have or make a fuel pressure regulator because that data point is so important in trying to troubleshoot your bike. Okay, what else do we have for troubleshooting tools? We have this little guy, and this is, allows us to run the pump uh, submerged in a little cup of gas to check for leaks and this often becomes a really helpful uh, troubleshooting diagnostic tool also there's this little guy this is pretty cool you can make your own fuel injection fuel injector cleaner so I like to clean my injectors uh, probably 200 hours uh, 250 is probably as long as I like an injector to go and so what I'll do uh, so a word on this there's a couple of ways you can do this. One of them is send them out to a professional injector cleaner. That is a fabulous way to, to go. You'll get a before and after report and you'll know it's professionally cleaned. And um, I have only good things to say about doing that. Downside is, is it uh, might cost you a couple of bucks and it's going to take that time. And there's another way that you could do this. I showed you the one in the field, that little trick if you are stranded. But another way is to use, and you can get these from us or you can make one of these yourselves, but you just get the uh, female side of the plug that's the match for your injector you plug this little guy in there and you can power your injector with a 9 volt battery and then what what I do is I will take a piece of fuel line uh, up to about two feet I will do what I showed you earlier oh here is a thing to be very aware of if you ever remove your injector this o-ring needs to be uh, inspected and replaced that's critical and then there is an o-ring down here where this seals the injector at the bottom into the throttle body. Where's that hole? Right there. And so that's where the injector goes in and the O-ring seals that. I once had a bike that had all kinds of weird problems and the guy had not installed that O-ring. And so he was leaking air through here, dirty air. Just, it, there was, it, this was a tough one to chase down. So you need to make sure that you have the o-ring on there and make sure that it's clean and intact okay so back to the little shop cleaning this is a really good I, I do this all the time so you power the injector put it in backwards remember that put your hose clamp on there and then I take two feet of hose and I fill up the the, the um, I fill up the hose with either fuel or some type of solvent carb spray whatever and then I've got two feet of, you know, that cleaner in there. And with the injector held open with a 9-volt battery, I'll take my shop air on this side and put about, uh, I do a little more than 50. So I'll, I'll run it up to about 80, maybe 90 PSI. And I back pressure, I back pressure, I flush that, that cleaning solution out the injector on this side at, at, at about 80 or 90 PSI. And that is very effective. At cleaning an injector. I have not done that method and then sent this off to be professionally calibrated and tested to, to, to determine. You know, you could do, you could send this out and have it get the known numbers and then do this and then resend it out. I have not done all that, but I can say after years and years of doing this method, um, it's worked 100% of the time. It's very reliable and I've never had any issues. So I am an advocate for uh, an advocate for cleaning your injector uh, somewhat often, 200 hours or so. There, you know, gas sits inside of your tank, and you get the separation of the ethanol, the, the volatile organics, and then the solvents in there. And there's all kinds of things that are attacking the orifice here, the outlet port of the injector itself. And so, getting some clogs in there is a known thing, and it it, it can happen. And cleaning the injector is a nice bit of maintenance to just make sure that you don't have drivability problems on your bike. And so, that's my method for cleaning the injector. It works very well. And, uh, you know, I think that's it. We covered a lot in this video. Thank you for hanging in there. I appreciate you watching these. Um, we're always reading the comments and trying to 
um, respond to you. We keep the comments turned on on all of our videos. We want the feedback. We want the give and take of that. And if you have any questions or you don't think we covered anything or you think that uh, I misspoke in any way, I am open to your suggestions and your comments about all that. We try to make these as accurate as possible, but you know we can make mistakes. Um, and so thank you for watching. Please uh, like and subscribe and let us know if uh, we can do anything to serve you better. Go out and get some adventure.